Welcome to the UCL Minds uh, Lunch Hour Lecture Series. Um, thank you very much for coming. My name is Kaška Porajska Pomsta, and I'm Head of Research at the Department of Culture, Communication and Media at the Institute of Education. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce my de departmental colleague, Zofia Dimen, and her talk, uh, which she will be giving uh, today, entitled, Why are voices that others cannot hear so powerful? Sophia is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics at the Center for Applied Linguistics in the Department of Culture, Communication and Media here at UCL. Uh, she's interested in the implications of how people use language, for example, metaphors, humor, personal pronouns, to describe their experiences of illness, including in the context of so-called psychosis and schizophrenia. She is author of multiple publications, including books, such as Sylvia Plath and the Language of Affective States, Written Discourse and the Experience of Depression, published by Bloomsbury in 2015. She is co-author of Metaphor, Cancer and the End of Life, a corpus-based study published by Rutledge uh, in 2018. She's also editor of Applying Linguistics in Illness and Healthcare Contexts, uh, published in Bloomsbury, by Bloomsbury in 2020, so it is an upcoming publication. And she also is a co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Metaphor and Language, which was published in 2017. Her work uh, has appeared in the Journal of Pragmatics, the BMJ's Medical Humanities, and Psychosis, amongst many other uh, venues and amongst many other publications. Sophia recently led a project investigating the extent to which implicit power relationships in the language people use to talk about their voice hearing experiences can predict their likely level of distress. And today's talk is largely based on this project. So without further ado, I give voice to uh, Dr. Diemen. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, for offering up your lunchtime. Bon appétit to those of you who are eating. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, why are voices that others cannot hear so powerful? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? And the first thing to note is that this project was a collaboration between four individuals, uh, three linguists, that's Agnes, Elena and myself, and a clinical psychologist, Filippo Varese. Um, and we were particularly interested in the power, the relative power of uh, voices versus voice hearers because we know that the, this power relationship is related to the likely uh, level of distress that people will experience as a result of these experiences, um, uh, these perceptions. But the majority of us are linguists, so as linguists we'll be interested in how power is exercised, expressed, constructed via language specifically. So that's what I'll be talking about today. <clears throat> how people report the voices as speaking to them. Um, and I'll start with a little bit of context, tr just trying to outline why this might be worth doing. Um, I'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about the particular linguistic framework, the particular linguistic lens that we used to actually look at what people told us their voices were saying. And then I'll focus uh, a little bit on so-called distressing voices, so the voice hearing experiences that cause people the greatest level of distress, because this is where the power relationships are highest and, and most interesting um, for the kind of analysis that we can do. But I will also talk about less distressing voices where the power relationships are constructed in language differently, and that is actually related to why they are less distressing. I'll uh, sum up at the end and, and talk a little bit about why this kind of work might matter in a practical sense. Uh, and throughout the lecture, there will be two things uh, for you to do, uh, so please do indulge me on, on these. It won't be very taxing, I promise. <coughs> So just a little bit of context, what is, what is voice hearing? Voice hearing basically involves the perception of verbal content in the absence of an appropriate external stimulus. And this in some clinical contexts is referred to as auditory verbal hallucinations. Uh, 
And I make that point for a particular reason, um, because before I go further than that, here's the first thing that I would like you to do. I'm going to pose you a challenge, and it is the same challenge that Nathan Filer poses his readers at the beginning of his new book, The Heartland. And I'm going to be silent for a particular reason. I'd like you to read this to yourselves for now. So the challenge is to try and remember the last time that you hallucinated. And Nathan Filer continues thus. Maybe it was when you read that sentence if your brain helpfully removed the extra the between the words um, remember and last. How many of you didn't read the two thes? There you go. Or maybe it was the last time, the, the time you felt your phone buzz in your pocket or heard it chime only to take it out and realize there was no message waiting. Or if you're me, the last time you heard your baby crying when he was actually in nursery. It happens. Now the experiences I'll be talking about today and the examples I'll be showing you are, uh, do not fall into these categories. But I still find this a helpful way of establishing a little bit of common ground between the things that we all experience and the, things, the experiences that only some of us share. The examples I'll be talking about today are distressing, a lot of them. Uh, they involve offensive language, taboo words. Um, and at this point, I just want to point out that I will be reading them out word for word as the participants told them to us. This for me is very important because I think that it is the only way that we can stay true to the kinds of experiences that people have uh, kindly shared with us. Um, but it's worth remembering as we look through the examples. And establishing common ground is also important because voice hearing is often seen as a characteristic symptom of uh, so-called schizophrenia spectrum disorders. But that is not to say that people who hear voices necessarily have mental health problems. And in fact, about 10% of the general population hears voices. And even among those uh, people who have some form of a clinical diagnosis, a sizable minority do not find these uh, experiences distressing. They can cope quite well with them. And so we know that actually distress is not linked to the mere presence of voices, but actually to the power relationship between the voice and the voice hearer, and the control or the lack thereof that the voice hearer feels over the voices. And so it is in this context that I'm interested in power and the way that it is expressed in language. Of course, because this is already known, the power relationships are attended to in clinical literatures, in therapeutic practice, all of these things. But the current approaches to assessing levels of power, the types of relationships that people have with their voices, uh, tend to rely on explicit questions in the form of questionnaires or interviews or psychometric tests. That's all good and well, but it does rely on people's uh, conscious awareness of these things and also on their willingness to disclose them. And it is also known that none of this can be assumed in all contexts. Now, a linguistic analysis has a slightly different approach. The kind of linguistic analysis that I do doesn't necessarily ask these questions explicitly. What we would say instead is, tell us about what this is like for you. What kinds of things do the voices say? And then we pay attention not just to what the person reports, but also how they do that. How do they themselves use language to talk about these experiences? And then we do the same to the, to the kinds of things that the voices are reported as saying. How do the voices express themselves? And this is a bit of a more implicit method of assessment, if that's what you're interested in. But it also provides opportunities for understanding these experiences in slightly different ways. And I'm hopeful, hopeful that I'll show you one of these ways today. I keep doing that. Now, the particular uh, linguistic framework that I'll be using today is called rapport management. So this is the lens that I've used to look through at the data, at the examples. And rapport management, also called, it's a version of politeness theory, and it's about 
understanding how language is used to maintain or disrupt social harmony as we all go about doing our everyday business. Now, why do we need to maintain social harmony? Well, because my goals and what I want to do might conflict with your goals and what you want to do. So, for example, um, as a lecturer, I might be required to give uh, feedback to students and some of that feedback might be critical. Now, giving that feedback might conflict on that student's desire to be seen in a positive light. And so how do we manage that conflict? Similarly, uh, in a classroom, I might be cold and would like the window to be closed, but some of the students might be warm and would like the window to be open. So how do we negotiate that potential conflict between the kinds of things that we want to achieve? And this idea of goals and how we see ourselves relies on two central uh, concepts. It relies on the concept of face and the concept of sociality rights. These are terms from within the rapport management uh, theory. Face is kind of our sense of self, which is partly related to how others see us. And sociality rights refers to our freedoms, the kinds of things that we might want to do or that we might expect. Face can be broken down into three categories. There's uh, everyone's individual identity face, which is the sense of self that you derive from your personal qualities, um, your, your need or, or want to be evalu evaluated positively in terms of your personal qualities. There's relational identity face, which is more about your social relationships. So your sense of self that you get from your positive or negative uh, social relationships. And there's social identity face, which is the sense of self that you derive from your social roles. Uh, so myself as a lecturer or as a mother. Sociality rights, like I said, are not so much to do with a sense of self, but more with the kinds of freedoms that you might want to have. And again, this breaks down. There is um, equity rights, uh, which is your desire and expectation to be treated fairly, to not be imposed upon, and to not be exploited. And association rights, which are more to do with being able to associate with the people you want to in the ways that you want to do so. So far, so good? Yeah? Okay, I'm almost done with the theory. Now, because our goals might conflict in the ways that I described. What we need to do uh, in order to maintain social harmony is to mitigate the way that we achieve our goals, the way that we go about achieving our goals. And so we might take different kinds of orientation in the way that we try and get someone to close the window or in the way that we deliver critical feedback. We might take a sort of harmony maintenance orientation where we mitigate any imposition of, uh, of, uh, uh, or of a threat to face. So we might say things like the blue shirt suits you better instead of saying the red shirt does not suit you. Or we might say things like could you possibly see me sometime next week instead of see me next week, right? And these are mitigated because the person has options in terms of how they respond, how they take what you've said. We might also take a different approach and go out of our way to bolster or enhance somebody's uh, sociality rights or face. So we might say things like, that was the best curry I ever had, instead of, you know, that was quite nice. Um, or we might go out of our way to ensure that people can do what they wish to do and we might say things like make yourself at home. Now these two orientations, these two strategies broadly fall into what we call politeness in linguistic theory and luckily it more or less overlaps with what everybody else also calls politeness. But there are situations in life, there are circumstances when you might want to uh, damage social harmony, when you might actively want to attack someone, an attack orientation, for example, in an argument. So you might say things like, you're an idiot, or piss off. This falls into something that in linguistic theory is called impoliteness, which is actually a very mild term for the kinds of things that it, it does cover. Now, why does all of this matter? It matters because which orientation you choose, how you go about achieving your goals, 
is intimately connected with the kinds of power that you possess in relation to the person that you're interacting with. And this sort of relies on an assumption that is, as linguist discourse analysts we share, which is that language both reflects and helps to construct power relationships. So, for example, a powerful participant has more freedom to use fewer politeness features and to be more impolite. Typical example of this is a parent-child relationship, where as a par parent you can issue commands, don't do that, they may or may not be followed, but you have a right to say that. Whereas the other way around, it doesn't quite work. It's socially unacceptable, even though it does happen. Okay? And essentially, it's not just that this, this ability to say things or not say things reflects existing power relationships, but it's also that we claim power by behaving in a certain way. So you become the powerful parent by saying certain things. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And in particular, attacks or impoliteness are an, a very effective way of getting or exercising power in a, in a particular interaction. And this is because if you attack somebody's face or sociality rights, so you call them stupid, you tell them to piss off, then that person whose, whose face or sociality rights are damaged, their response options are limited. It's very difficult to ignore that kind of thing. You're kind of forced into an action, and thereby somebody is forcing you to do something. They're exercising power over you. And we do tend to know that asymmetrical patterns, in particular of impoliteness, so attacks on face or sociality rights, tend to occur in situations where there is a more powerful person and a less powerful person. And the more powerful is targeting the less powerful. Okay. So much for the theory. Now here's the next thing that I would like you to do. I'm going to show you a series of statements um, these are all real statements, uh, either uttered or written, in a particular context, and they will include uh, taboo words, they will include swear words, they're very harsh, they're very offensive, but I would like you to imagine what context these statements might occur in. They're not from a voice-hearing context. The statements are as follows. You fucking foreign lady, you cunt, you are a terrorist, you don't answer because you know you're the lowest of the low, I'm gonna kill you and your family, let's kill him, get them out of our country. Twitter, <laughs> yes, possibly, some of them will have occurred on Twitter, yes. Any other guesses? Uh, race, yes, race is a good guess. It's not, it's not actually Brexit, but might well be, yes. Middle East. Middle East, yes, again, bringing in the racial aspect, absolutely. There are actually statements from documents uh, of cases brought before the Crown Courts in the UK between 2012 and 2013. And the cases from which these statements come all had indictments or charges for religiously aggravated hate offenses. So essentially, these statements, together with various other things that would have happened in these cases, uh, can be considered examples of religiously aggravated hate crimes. So you were all uh, uh, sort of along the right lines. Now, why am I showing you this? <clears throat> well, in these cases, the offenders, or the alleged offenders, are exercising power by saying these things to other people, uh, by insulting them, uh, by threatening them, and by inciting others to violence. But in these cases, taking this to court is a way of redressing that power imbalance. It's an attempt at getting power back on the part of the victim. Now, remember these statements 
And remember that option that the victims have in this case as we look at the examples from, uh, from voice hearing context. And this is where I'll tell you a little bit about the voice hearing context. So the examples I'll be talking about today uh, come from 10 research interviews. Um, and these research interviews were conducted with so-called clinical voice hearers. So these are people who hear voices and who also have a diagnosis, in this case, of schizophrenia. Five women, five men, and they generally ranged from coping very well with their voice hearing experiences to uh, being extremely distressed. We partly know this because uh, the interviewees also completed the various psychometric tests, standard psychometric tests, in the course of the interviews to assess their levels of distress. However, the linguists analyzing the data did not have access to this. So we were blind to where people fell on this climb. So we simply looked at the language and tried to see where they might be falling in terms of the power relationships that are constructed and in terms of the ways the voices behaved and the people behave back to the voices. The interviews were transcribed verbatim and fully anonymized. So I'll be referring to uh, participants as P6, P11 um, for, uh, in an anonymized way. And it's important to point out that this is a secondary analysis. So these interviews, along with many others, were collected for uh, different studies. Um, so the purpose wasn't to assess the level of power, but we can still apply the linguistic frameworks to these cases as well. Okay. As I mentioned, I will start with voices that are more distressing and describe how the voices exercise power, thereby causing distress. So the voices claim power by attacks on people's face and people's sociality rights. I mean, the whole, uh, everything I've said so far has been leading up to that. So I'll, I'll just demonstrate not just that they do that, but exactly how they do that. So the voices will issue insults which attack people's individual identity face. So their sense of self-worth in terms of their personal qualities uh, by saying things like, you worthless bastard, Look at you, you fucking ugly fat slag. And this is well known in the clinical literature, um, well documented, but this is by far not the only way in which the voices claim power. This is by far not the only thing that the voices do or say. They also issue warnings, you could argue. These are similar to threats, but similar to warnings as well, which undermine people's relational identity face, so their, their uh, social relationships. And these take the following form. It's going to be a disaster. You're not going to get on with that person. They're going to plot against you. They'll want to get rid of you as soon as they meet you. They, in this case, refers to the mental health practitioners that Participant 6 has a good relationship with. Um, and Participant 6 is very keen on this relationship with mental health practitioners. It is more or less the only social relationship he has at this point. Participant 11, um, similar examples. They're going to do something to you. They know things about you. Participant 11 is also particularly keen on social relationships. Uh, she finds it difficult to uh, make friends, and this is one of her main goals. She wants to be a bubbly person. She wants to make friends. Now, the voices undermine these very things. But if you think about them linguistically, so they make predictions, potentially, about third parties um, while attacking the person's relational identity face. And this suggests that the voice is more powerful in terms of knowledge. The voice knows more about these other people than the person knows themselves. So not only do they undermine the very thing that is important to these people in this context, but they also exercise power in a way that's very difficult to resist. And why is it difficult to resist or challenge? Well, because it's almost difficult to recognize these as attacks on relational identity face. Warnings are supposed to be for the person's benefit, for the hearer's benefit. So it's possible that someone who hears this might be unsure whether the voices at this point are actually on their side and want to make sure that no harm comes to them, or they're actually attacking them, they're against them. And in that context, how do you challenge the voices? How do you reassert your own power? 
And it's by far not the only thing that the voices do. So the voices will also ask so-called unpalatable or challenging questions. These attack both individual and relational identity face. So they'll say things like, ooh, why are they saying Haya to you? If you're getting on so great, how come you never get any positives from the last visit? Again, this is the healthcare visit. How come he, the nurse, is not here to support you now? Where is he when we're kicking the fuck out of you? Now these statements, these questions undermine people's relationships in the same way as the previous examples. And they also diminish the person's power because they're questions about third parties. Voice hearers have no way of actually answering these questions. So they cannot participate in this interaction in a way that would show that they're equal participants with the voice. But they are questions, and questions invite answers. So again, the participants uh, are forced um, into trying to react in some way. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And again, this is not the only way that the voices attack the hearers, um, the various aspects of the hearer. The voices also attack uh, threats on sociality rights. So. Um, uh, they threaten people's freedom, they, they undermine what people might want to do. So this is, remember, it's about expectations of, of being treated fairly, not being imposed upon, not being exploited, uh, and expectations of being allowed to associate with others as you see fit. So the threats that uh, voices will issue are, take the form of this. If you tell people what I say to you, you're going to be punished. We're going to kick the fucking shit out of your head. We're going to fucking have you for this. Now, threats in the impoliteness literature tend to come with conditions in the same way as the first example does here, if you tell people what I do. Conditions actually provide an opportunity for someone to avert the threat from being realized. If they don't fulfill that condition, then the threat doesn't happen. But in the case of participant six, who is actually our most distressed participant in, in the group, the threats that the voice issues are all unconditional, which means that the participant has no power at all to stop the threat from being realized. Okay. Thank you. And the voices are not done yet. So the other thing that the voices tend to do is something that might ring a bell in terms of the religiously aggravated hate crime data that I showed you. Even the threats are actually quite similar to the examples that we saw in that case. But there are also these examples of incitement. Um, in the clinical literature, these are sometimes referred to as command hallucinations, and they raise red flags, especially when they're about self-harm, such as kill yourself, blow the flat up, set yourself on fire, go out there later on today and walk under a bus. Put the iron on and when it gets hot, burn yourself. So, as I mentioned, they're similar to incitement to violence in the religiously aggravated hate crime data, but in this context, the person being incited to perform the violence is the same as the intended victim. And so, again, these induce fear in a really, really complex way. And the person doesn't really have any way of, of resisting potentially or challenging what is being said to them. And if you think back again, so if these examples are similar to examples of hate crime in that context, you can go and try and redress the power that's being exercised over you via the courts. In a voice hearing context, you do not have that option. Okay? Now, the distressing voices are so powerful because they relentlessly, repeatedly, and in multiple ways attack people's face, their sociality rights, um, in all kinds of different uh, 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 linguistic ways as well. But it doesn't always have to be like this. Not all voice hearing experiences are like that. And the less distressing voices behave differently. So they do sometimes also issue attacks, 
But these tend to be described as infrequent, or they tend to be milder, such as you're spiteful, or they tend to be mitigated in the way that the voice hearer describes them. So in this case, in the middle example, she can call me a murderer or a rapist or a thief or a pedophile or anything like that. The little can at the beginning, she can call me that, not she does, introduces just a tiny bit of mitigation which suggests a lower level of emotional intensity. But the main difference between most more distressing and less distressing voices is about the other strategies that the voices use. So less distressing voices tend to actively pay attention to how you might maintain social harmony using language. So they'll say things like, it's half time now, why don't you make a cup of tea? Instead of, make a cup of tea now. It's phrased as a question. And a question means that you have the option of saying no. Right? In the second example, if you did that too often, it would be a bit repetitive and you would get bored. It's a very indirect way of saying, don't do that. And again, the person then has the option, linguistically speaking, very easily to decide, well, actually, I'm okay with getting a bit bored. I'll just keep doing it anyway. And what's interesting is that in at least one case, but not the only case, um, this kind of uh, paying attention to social harmony goes both ways. So the voice hearer will also use maintenance strategies when they speak to the voice. And it's a little bit more difficult to analyze these examples because we don't have direct quotations. But when participant 13 says, I will try and correct her, or point her in the right direction, or I am probably more giving them advice, then these little words, try and probably, again suggest that there is attention being paid to maintaining social harmony. And actually, participant 13 tells us that the voices actively ask for the advice and support that he provides. But less distressing voices also actively try to bolster or enhance the voice hearer's face and sociality rights. So they'll pay them compliments. You have done okay. You will soon be writing that book, which is not a command because participant 33 actually wants to be writing. So this is a reassurance. Participant 29 has multiple voices and one of them will hear the other voices and then say things to calm me down. Participant 13 talks about the voices supporting him. And so, in these cases, you could argue that praising someone involves a sort of exercise of power, because if you praise someone for that to be meaningful, you kind of know more than the person. But the crucial difference is that these, um, uh, these statements are for the person's benefit, they do not require a response, so they don't force people into a response uh, options that they might not want to take. And again, there is a sense of reciprocity, in particular for participant 13. Notice even the parallel ways in which it's being described. They try to support me, I try and support her. So while a praising context, you might argue, is again similar to a parent-child relationship, a positive parent-child relationship, because the parent knows more and can praise the child, this idea of mutual support is much more like a friendship or a relationship between siblings. And in fact, that's exactly how participant 13 uh, describes the relationship with their voices. I treat her like a sister, they treat me as a friend. Now, one could say, you might argue, that these voices just happen to behave in this way. They speak like this, and so these people who hear these types of voices are lucky. But the point about this is that especially in a voice hearing context, there is very little other than language to go on in terms of the power relationship. So power is not just reflected in language, it's also created in language, which means that it can also be renegotiated in language. So you can change the way that you speak to the participant and thereby alter the way that you relate to each other. And of course, 
this is exactly what talking therapies and relational therapies uh, to do with voice hearing tend to rely on. Let me just summarize. So a high level of distress tends to come with very powerful voices which exercise their power with a high frequency of attacks, um, a wide range of attacks, both in terms of the linguistic strategies that they use, so whether they issue insults or unpalatable questions, and also in the, the aspects of the person that they criticize. So they go for individual identity face, relational identity face, and sociality rights altogether. Some of these attacks, such as the warnings I, told, I, I described, are not prototypical attacks, and so they might be difficult to recognize as such, um, and therefore to resist or challenge. Again, limiting people's response options. The attacks that are issued are particularly severe, and in some cases they undermine the things that are important, that are especially important to the people concerned. On the other hand, um, lower level of distress, it's not that the voices are by default less powerful, it's that they do not spend as much time exercising the power, their power, in the language that they use. So the attacks are less frequent and less severe. Um, they tend to pay active attention to maintaining social harmony, so they use maintenance and enhancement strategies. And this allows the hearers a wider range of response options, even a non-response option. So they can resist or ignore or challenge their voices more easily. And in some cases, we can see more reciprocity um, in interaction, which suggests more of a power balance. So why does this matter? This is my last slide. Um, basically, exploring how voices speak. Well, it enables us to take what people tell us seriously. We're subjecting it to proper analysis here. It enables us to understand how the voices um, exercise their power, and therefore why they might be so distressing. It also allows us to understand the experiences in a slightly different way, for example, as, as criminal. And so we can make comparisons between how we all might feel in that context and how the voice hearers might be feeling. Now, these, the, the methods that I showed you, it's a very, very small study. Um, you know, we talked about 10 people. Um, but the methods and the sort of b the beginnings of the insights that we have have the potential to feed into existing relational and talking therapies, which are about re uh, renegotiating the relationship with the voices. And they can feed into that in different ways. Our hope um, is that they can be used to evaluate why some uh, therapies or, or some sessions are more effective than others and they might be able to feed into actually making therapies more effective by providing a framework and some ideas about exactly how to change the language that we use. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, hi, thanks for the lecture, very good. Um, just a quick question about um, the voices that they hear. Do they believe they're real people, or what do they believe they are? And does that make a difference on whether they're positive or negative? So it's a difficult question to answer. So people um, absolutely believe that the voices are real, and, and they are real. They, they are experiencing these things, right? So for them, they are absolutely real. Uh, whether they are real people or not tends to depend uh, so some people hear the voices of people that they've known in the past. Um, other people don't recognize uh, the, the voices in that sense, but the voices will have particular identities and characteristics that are attributed to them. So people will know when it's one voice versus another voice that they're hearing. Um, th there isn't a clear link that I know about between that and the level of distress. There is another question. Yeah, well, what are some of the um, sort of exact differences between the voices that these voice hearers hear and the, the kind of cognition that occurs or that is observed in kind of the thinking of anxious and depressed people, where CBT tries to make those voices quite clear and verbal as well? Again, a tr tricky question to answer because my area of expertise is the linguistics. Um, but uh, 
from as I, as I understand it, it's it's a Klein. Uh, and actually, there are some studies that look at um, sort of internal voices uh, when we hear our own voice, sort of when we say things out loud and uh, not out loud, but in our heads, if you see what I mean, and and how that relates to these other voice hearing experiences, where the voices are not necessarily perceived as internal, but they're perceived as coming from the outside. So that's one of the main differences, um, but not necessarily the only one. Does that help? Yeah. So one thing that um, in your example for, I think, threats uh, and the power of the distressing threat, um, you said one of the uh, participants uh, that were categorically less distressed. Mm -hmm. um, in that example, that individual had a threat coming from an in a single person or a single voice because mm -hmm. they used the word I mm -hmm. in that threat. Um, and your other example used we. So mm -hmm. how did you classify whether or not uh, the power from, I guess, an attack that would be multiple voices? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, initially, we thought that it would be possible to keep the separate voices apart um, and to try and understand which voices were powerful and which ones weren't. Um, what tended to happen in the interviews is that people alternated between attributing certain things to one particular voice, uh, attributing things to a collective of voices, and not necessarily making clear which, which of those two categories it fell in. So in the end, we decided to treat uh, every voice hearer's voices as one um, group or individual, um, and we focused on, on what they say. It's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but in this study and in, in subsequent studies as well, just because of the way that people tend to describe these voices, it's the only way that we can actually defend. Otherwise, making the distinctions would be our interpretation that, that wouldn't necessarily hold up in each case. In addition to the first question, what about those who are in denial? I, as an outsider, think someone might hear voices and they blame it on there is something underneath there is, so, there is something underneath there somewhere Th that tends to happen a lot it it didn't happen in in amongst our 10 interviewees because they were already involved with mental health services so there was um in, in clinical literature, it tends to be referred to as insight, uh, whatever that means. But they understood that the experiences that they were having were real, but weren't shared with other people. Um, so the, those are the only ones that we can actually look at, because the only access we have to what the voices might be saying are from people actually telling us. Hi, um, my question is a practical question, really, about whether you're going to publish some of this stuff, because I would like to share it with my team, I work at Mind in Camden on the Hearing Voices projects. Um, so we set up peer support groups for voice hearers and deliver trainings about our work. And we think and talk a lot about language. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it would be really nice to kind of be able to read it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, coming out in the collection that Kashka mentioned, the 2020 um, collection. This particular paper is in there. But if you email me, I can send you an advance copy. <laughs> Um, after your anonymous analysis, did you then look at the um, at the quotes at the um, at the language from the perspective of um, gender, and did you find any differences there? We we had a brief look, uh, but we didn't find any differences. No, and in fact, our intuitions as to who might be a woman and who might be a man were off. So no, we couldn't find any correlations like that. Oh, hi. Um, hi. Just on the voices, um, I mean, voices can uh, enhance or attack the identities, and you did mention that voices have uh, have identities. But actually, quite interestingly, I quite like to ask about the, the intervention, because before I came to this lecture, I went to another room, they're actually talking about the aims of interve intervention, and mm -hmm. one of them is I cannot promise that voices will go away or even reduce in frequencies. But, and then I have five lists of things about what intervention can, can, can you say about um, you're dealing with the voices, particularly the negative voices, mm. either as perceived voices or in uh, experience, experience as sensation, feelings, or cognition? Yeah. Mm. So 
the, the kind of analysis that, that we're doing here, the hope is that the way that it feeds into intervention is that people are more able to use language not to reduce the frequency of these voice hearing experiences, but to change the way that they relate to the voice. Okay, so it's about if the voice is being the more powerful participant by talking in a particular way, the less powerful participant, because the power is in the language, has the opportunity to try and change that, to try and challenge it, to try and even initiate the more amicable relationship and to model the behavior that they would like the voice to take on. So it's about creating an analogy between how this would work in a conflict situation between two people that everybody can, can see, right? And if one starts shouting and you shout back, then the conflict tend to, tends to escalate. But if you try and remain calm and be polite and pay attention to why that person might be behaving in the way that they are, why they might be speaking in the way that they are, then that might actually reduce their anger and de-escalate the conflict. So that's the idea. It's about changing the nature of the relationship um, through language. Yeah? Okay, I don't think we have any more time for questions. Uh, thank you very much again for participating in, the, in this lecture and let's give a last round of applause to Sophia. Thank you for coming. Thank you.